Hello, my name is Grant Kramer, and I'm a professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today, we will talk about yeast fermentation. This is the second in a series of two videos. In this video, we will talk about the different kinds of species of yeast that are involved in wine making, uh, both inoculated yeast and indigenous yeast. And then there will be a couple of practical tips at the end of the video on how to start a fermentation. Very simple, practical steps. Today, we will be talking about cultured and wild yeasts involved in winemaking. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the common yeast associated with winemaking. S. cerevisiae has been favored due to its predictable and vigorous fermentation capabilities. Its relatively high levels of alcohol and sulfur dioxide tolerance, as well as its ability to thrive in normal pH of wine between the pH of 2.8 and 4. S. cerevisiae is rarely the only yeast species involved in fermentation. Other genera of wild yeast can be involved in winemaking, either beneficially or as causes of wine faults. Saccharomycotes is one group. The S. Luigi strains are suitable for brewing low alcohol products, such as beer. Schizos saccharomyces is the only wine yeast reproducing by fission and very distantly related to saccharomyces. Zygosaccharomyces are very alcohol tolerant and can grow in wines up to 18% and can survive in extremely high sugar levels, up to 60% or 60 bricks and is very resistant to sulfur dioxide. Areobacidium is known as the black yeast, which is found in moist wine cellars and can contaminate aging wines in barrels. Brettanomyces is another important yeast, known commonly as Brett. Its impact on wine is debatable. Some people find that they like the added complexity that Brett adds to a wine but many consider this a wine fault. Clockera and Candida, these genera are some of the most common wild yeast carried on harvested grapes. Pichia, some species of these interfere with alcohol fermentation. Some species create wine faults. So as I mentioned before, the genus Saccharomyces is favored for winemaking because it is generally producing reliable and positive attributes to the wine. Other Saccharomyces species, other than Cerevisiae, which are involved in winemaking, are Saccharomyces veticus, Saccharomyces fermentati, Saccharomyces paradoxus, Saccharomyces pastorianus, and Saccharomyces uverum. Saccharomyces bianus is another species of yeast which tolerates alcohol levels up to 17 to 20% alcohol. It's often used in fortified wine productions in the making of ports or certain varietal wines such as Zinfandel and Syrah, which are harvested at high sugar concentrations producing high percentage alcohol wines. Wild yeasts often begin the fermentation process due to the weight of grape clusters in the harvest bins crushing the grapes and releasing the rich must. Wild yeast will usually die once the alcohol level reaches about 3 to 5% due to the toxicity of the alcohol on the yeast cells, while more alcohol-tolerant Saccharomyces species continue fermenting. Sulfur dioxide additions added to the must may also limit some of the wild yeast activities. So there are more than 700 different strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The differences between the vast majority of these strains are mostly minor. Individual winemakers will develop a preference for a particular strain when making certain wines or working with particular grape varieties. These yeasts will usually readily ferment glucose, sucrose, maltose, triolose, and other sugars. But Saccharomyces cannot ferment pentoses, which are residual sugars usually present in small amounts in wines. Not all strains are suitable for winemaking. The magnitude of the differences between the various strains and their potential impact on the wine is debated. Temperature tolerance is one important difference. They also have differences in terms of the production of off flavors. Some distinct differences among the various strains include the production of certain off flavors and aromas that may be temporary, which produce a sort of stinky fermentation, 
or could remain in the wine for longer duration. Another important difference between strains is their vigor or the speed of the fermentation in which the yeast strains have the tendency to do fast ferments while others take longer to start. Wild yeast and natural fermentation. Wild yeast refer to the yeast that have not been intentionally inoculated into the juice or the must. Wild yeast are often referred to as ambient, indigenous, or natural yeast, as opposed to the inoculated, selected, or cultural yeast. Wild yeast often come in contact with a must through their presence on harvest equipment, transport bins, surfaces of winemaking equipment, and as a part of the natural flora of a winery. Studies have shown that S. cerevisiae is the main genus found in wineries. Despite efforts to thoroughly clean the winery, this is still the most prevalent genus in the winery and therefore contributes the most to natural or indigenous yeast cultures. Roughly 160 to 100,000 colony forming units of wild yeast per berry could exist in a typical vineyard. Yeast can be carried by air currents, birds, or insects, including the dreaded fruit flies, into and throughout the vineyard. Most common wild yeast found in the vineyard are from the genera Clochera, Candida, and Piscia. Clochera apiculata is the most dominant species by far. Wineries that often solely rely on these indigenous strains will sometimes market their wines as being the product of wild or natural fermentations. Use of indigenous non-Saccharomyces wild yeast carries benefits and risks. Some winemakers feel that the resident indigenous yeast help contribute to their unique expression of the terroir in their wine. And in fact, this has been supported by research to show that vineyards in different locations have different populations of yeast on their grapes. Many of the highly regarded estates in Bordeaux will often tout the quality of their resident chateau strains, and many others are picking up on this bandwagon. Wineries will often take the leftover pomace and lees from the winemaking and return them to the vineyard to be used as compost to help sustain the presence of favorable strains. However, ambient yeast may have unpredictable fermentations. A stuck fermentation is possible if indigenous yeast strains are not vigorous enough to fully convert all the sugars. And ambient yeast may produce off flavors and aromas and have higher volatile acidity. Okay, now for inoculated yeast. Winemakers usually want predictable and reliable fermentations by a strain that has a track record of dependability. Inoculated yeast, usually from pure cultures, are strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that have been identified and purified from wineries around the world, perhaps having been cultured several centuries ago. There are a variety of characteristics that are desirable for yeast strains to have for wine fermentation. For example, by quickly outcompeting the wild yeast for nutrients in the must. Also another important trait is the complete utilization of all the fermentable sugars with a predictable sugar to alcohol conversion rate, high alcohol tolerance, up to 15% or even higher, high sulfur dioxide tolerance, low production of sulfur compounds such as hydrogen sulfide or dimethyl sulfide, the production of minimal amounts of residual pyruvate, acetic acid and acid aldehyde, the production of minimum foaming, which may create difficulties for cap management during maceration or cause bungs to pop out during barrel fermentation and have high levels of flocculation and lees compaction, which makes for improved racking, fining, and filtering of the wine in later processes. Okay, just in summary, with a few practical tips included, most yeasts are sensitive to SO2. However, the Saccharomyces genera are more tolerant to SO2 and higher alcohol. Therefore, treatment with SO2 gives Saccharomyces an advantage to start the fermentation and then outcompetes the other yeast species. It's very important to activate your yeast prior to the start of your fermentation. To activate your yeast, you place the yeast contents into a small volume of warm water at 40 degrees centigrade, 
or 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is lukewarm to the touch of your finger. And you allow that to go on for 20 minutes. Prior to that, it's an, a good idea to add some nutrients to that activation water uh, to further enhance the development of the yeast. This includes some nutrients and sugar. Oxygen is also very important at the start of fermentation. The yeast need to divide and grow very quickly to dominate the must. And in order to do that, they need oxygen to produce a lot of energy. This allows them to divide, but this also allows the yeast to prepare their membranes for normal function. If you were to throw dry yeast into your must, you would have a, perhaps a stuck fermentation or maybe a fermentation that wouldn't even get going. So it's very important to activate your yeast. Later on, oxygen is not desirable, but the yeast and their activities will reduce that volume quite a bit. Oxygen also has some negative effects on the wine later on. So it's very important not to oxygenize your wine later on or to allow oxygen to get into your wine. In particular, it causes some browning effects due to oxidation by the enzyme polyphenol oxidase. The amount of yeast that you need is relatively small, about 0.1 or 0.2 grams of yeast per liter of must that you're going to ferment. The typical fermentation temperature for white wines is between 60 and 70 degrees, and we have a somewhat higher temperature for red wines from 70 to 80 degrees in order to improve the extraction of colors and tannins out of the skins. Finally, what are some of the causes of stuck fermentation? Nutrient limitations is an important one. So usually we give nutrients to the must prior to the fermentation or within a day after the start of the fermentation. This includes nitrogen, phosphate, some vitamins and minerals. So a deficiency in one of these can cause a stuck fermentation down the road, halfway through the fermentation, for example. Substrate inhibition, so excess sugar, if sugar concentrations are too high, this can cause an interference in the fermentation process. Ethanol toxicity, so if it is a susceptible genera, then ethanol can kill it off at a low concentration. Ultimately, this does this to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but it's up around 15%. Ethanol toxicity is also influenced by the deficiency of survival factors and or oxygen in the solution. The production of toxic substances can interfere with the fermentation. And finally, just a huge change in temperature. So when you activate your ferment, it's a very different temperature from the must that you're adding it to. It can cause a temperature shock uh, resulting in a stuck fermentation. Well, that's it. That's really a, a brief introduction to fermentation. As you can see, fermentation is quite complicated and there are many variables to what make a good or a poor fermentation. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. Goodbye.